Hello everyone, this is Martin Rooney and welcome back to the Coach to Coach Show. And as promised, this is the Super Bowl edition of the Coach to Coach Show. And this edition is taking place just a few days before the Super Bowl. And today, I am going to guarantee, today I am going to guarantee who the winner will be. So if you want to lay down some bets, you need to stay with me till the very end here uh, because I have the answer for you and I have never been wrong about this one. Now, let's talk about the Super Bowl first because I have a lot of great stuff for you today. I have got stories. I have got coaching wisdom. I promise, man, I've been putting this together for a while and as always with anything I do, I want to thank you for listening to it. I want to thank you for being part of it. And the way that I'm going to thank you is giving you some really, really great content. So let's start off. This is Super Bowl 54. And why, why do I think this show is so special today? And why did I have to do this? Why was I compelled to do this? It's Super Bowl 54, but the 50th modern era NFL championship game. So it's Super Bowl 54, but the 50th modern era NFL game, and you ready for this? This championship, this Super Bowl, will decide the champion for the 2019 season, although we're in 2020, but it will be the 100th season of the NFL. So if you've been following the NFL, this is the 100th season. This is going to be the season and the Super Bowl that determines the winner of the 100th season. So I think it's special, and I wanted to make sure that I share it. Now, if you have been living under a rock, it will be the San Francisco 49ers versus the Kansas City Chiefs. And right now, because I see a lot of people uh, checking in, and I'm so happy to see a lot of the names that I see, and I'm going to be giving everybody some shout-outs, I have already said that I am going to tell you who the winner will be this Sunday. But now I want who you think it will be. So to create some interaction, which this is what coach to coach is all about. I'm getting coach to coach with you. And by the way, everyone is a coach. So I want to know right now, who do you think is going to win? Who do you think is going to win? I want to take a little poll right now. And I want to see who you think is going to win the Super Bowl, right? As we're seeing some answers. So already right there, Anthony David, the siren checking in saying, let's go chiefs. I want to see who we think is going to win this game the most of all the coaches that get on here. Uh, and I will be writing you back. So if you interact with me here, I'm going to write you back. But let me tell you a few more things about the Super Bowl while we're letting everybody get on. The halftime show is going to be J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez, and Shakira. Like that, that's going to be a big halftime show. So I think a lot of people are going to be watching. But listen to this. I remember when a minute-long commercial cost like a million bucks. Well, for this the game that will decide the 100th NFL season, a 30-second commercial, is $5.6 million. So $5.6 million. The national anthem will be sung by Demi Lovato, and it will be played in the Hard Rock, State, Hard, you know, Hard Rock Stadium in Miami, Florida. So we have set the tone. We have set the table. I'm not going to tell you who wins yet, but already I'm seeing, I, I see Tom is coming in with the 49ers, Buffard going back with the Chiefs. I, I, uh, now, Corey Smallwood on the fence wavering. I want KC, but uh, my bet's on San Fran. Oh, I'm going to let you know at the end. I'm going to let you know. But here's what I want to start off with and, and what I put together for you today. Today, because as always, I'm going to talk about coaching. When we get coach to coach, I'm going to be talking about coaching. My mission is to make a world of better coaches. As you may have heard, I have a new book coming out called Coach to Coach. I'm going to talk about that at the end. But uh, today, I'm going to share what I call my five P's of coaching. And I just put these together because I wanted to put some great stories together, Super Bowl stories, in particular involving the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. So you can't believe how much stuff I had to put together for you here. But, uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. And not only that, but ultimately I want you to learn these lessons so you can take them with you so you can coach somebody up for their Super Bowl, right? So you can coach somebody up for something really special in their lives. Because let's not forget for a second, Super Bowl is one game every year 
And uh, if you're a coach right now, man, you're coaching people up all the time, right? All the time. So the first P, the first P is perspective. So I want you to listen to that word, perspective. A coach has to have perspective. Look, I, I was just trying to offer perspective right there. It's the Super Bowl, guys. So whether you're a Chiefs fan or a San Francisco 49ers fan, nobody should be fighting over it. Nobody should be brawling in the streets over it. It's a football game. And actually, you're not even playing in it. So just to offer the perspective, right? And perspective is a very powerful thing when it comes to a coach, but also when it comes to a player. And I want to show you something really cool. Hey, does anybody know who Joe Montana is? So right now I'm going to start first start talking. I got my Golden Gate Bridge right there. I'm going to first start talking about San Francisco. Not trying to give away who I think is going to win at the end. But Joe Montana, you remember him? Well, why I picked him first to talk about. A lot of people sometimes forget, unless you're a true fan. Joe Montana, yeah, he was a star for the 49ers and they won some Super Bowls, but he was also a great player for the Kansas City Chiefs, right? Which I think is pretty interesting. So who better to start off with than somebody that played on both teams? And I'm going to take you back. This dates me right here. And that's why I remember it so well. I'm going to take you back to my high school senior year, 1989, gulp, right? Just to date me. But uh, the 1989 Super Bowl Bengals, it was the San Francisco 49ers versus or what did I say? <laughs> it's the Cincinnati Bengals. So it was the Bengals versus the 49ers in 1989. And this is pretty powerful. Trailing 16 to 13 and getting the ball on their own eight yard line without much time left. Joe Montana, right? Broadway Joe. I, I think, I, I don't know if they call him that or not. Joe Montana gets the ball. And man, that had to be the most pressure Incredible thing. They either drive down and score or they lose the Super Bowl. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the pressure? There's a P word for you. Can you imagine the pressure? Can you imagine the stress? And do you know what Joe Montana did? He walked out into the huddle and he could see. He could see the guys were nervous, right? But they believed in him and it was time for him to coach them up. And do you know what he said? You know what he said? Instead of calling the play or instead of like saying, guys, this is it. This is the ultimate moment. We, this is do or die. We either do it now, which probably would have put too much per per pressure. He instead went for perspective. And he walked into the huddle and he looked around. And he goes, he goes, guys, 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 do you see that? Do you see that? And they all looked and he goes, is that John Candy? <laughs> so he goes, is that John Candy? The, like the famous comedian. And they all turned back and they saw the smile on his face. And many players tell that story and they say that's the moment they knew they were going to win the Super Bowl. When Joe Montana put it all into perspective and it's a big game and there's some famous guy and like, let's go have some fun. And then he mounted an 11 play, 92 yard drive that culminated with a touchdown pass and they won the Super Bowl. So for any Bengals fans listening to that, I hope you are not uh, offended or upset. I, you know, I, hey, I've uh, been uh, lucky enough to consult for the Bengals over the years too. So, hey, I'm a fan of all the teams in some way. But in his pressure moment, he kept perspective. And, uh, and uh, he had 31 comeback wins in his career like that. But um, I want to talk about coaching now because he was coaching the guys up. This is a very important uh, concept right here that – whether you're on a team right now or you think I'm on a team, I'm, a, I'm just a player. No, no, no. You are a coach to your teammates. If you are in a family right now, you are a coach to your brothers and sisters, to your parents, to your cousins, your aunts, your uncles. Guys, everybody's a coach. And you can always help somebody by offering the right perspective. Few things are final. Few things are fatal. Few things are the do or die moment. And if you can sometimes learn... A little secret from Joe Montana right there. Hey, put it in perspective and you're probably going to have a way better shot at getting it done. And great coaching tip for you right there. Now, the next one. The next one, right? Which I think you're going to like right here. Next P. The next P. Because we talked about pressure versus perception. I'm going to give you another one now. And then I'm going to show you something really interesting I found 
right here. Because right here, hey, I don't know if you read, I read Sports Illustrated. Now, one sad thing, I want to make a sad announcement right now. In uh, the editor's notes right here, hey, this is a very special edition of Sports Illustrated. Do you know why this is such a special edition of Sports Illustrated? It's the first time Sports Illustrated is moving to monthly. It's just going to be once a month. And I don't know if you're like me. I love reading and I love holding something in my hands. So that crushed me because, man, an American institution, the Sports Illustrated, because now we probably just don't read enough magazines. It has gone to monthly. That's the first thing. But that's not what's special. But what's interesting is, hey, there's a couple of X-49ers on there. There's Jerry Rice. There is Steve Young. But watch what I found in here, which is going to bring me to the next one. Let me read this. Wow. So there it is. January 22nd, 1989. Jerry Rice dispelled any rumors midweek that an ankle injury was going to stop him. And, uh... This was the catch, you know, uh, I, I guess from the, the drive where it says the cherry on top where Joe Montana's 11 yard or 11 play, 92 yard drive, and they win it all. And uh, they got a really cool picture in there. But I wanted to talk about Jerry Rice, which if you know anything about Jerry Rice's records, when a lot of people ask me, what's a record that is probably never going to get broken? If you look at Jerry Rice's yardage, I think also career receptions, and then you look at second place all time, that one's going to be tough to beat, especially in this day and age. And I want to tell you the secret that Jerry Rice used. Here's something interesting. Uh, Jerry Rice wasn't the best player in high school because he didn't go to a major university. He, uh, he went to, man, uh, Mississippi Valley State. You guys heard of that one? So Jerry Rice went to Mississippi Valley State. I, for anybody that is an alumni that's listening to this, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know about that university. Jerry Rice must not have been the best guy in college because he didn't get drafted number one. Right? He still got drafted pretty high because he was pretty solid. But when Jerry Rice got to the pros, he used another P word that made him the best, arguably, of all time. And you probably know what's coming here. You probably know what's coming. First thing is you got to put things into perspective. The second thing is you got to practice. You got to practice. You know what Jerry Rice is more famous for, for at least me, than his statistics? He's famous for the legendary workouts and the amount of routes that he would run again and again and again that you would hear about rookies, rookies coming in, uh, you know, to the professional leagues. These guys are incredible too. And these guys couldn't hang with him for one workout, even if it was in his 15th or 20th year in the NFL. In particular, there'd be this hill that he would run, this hill that nobody else could run. And he ran it every day up and down, like to warm up for practice. And here's what I want to tell you. This is important lesson here. I don't know why, as soon as somebody gets called a coach, they think it's okay to stop practicing. I know a coach understands, man, I got to make my people practice, make my people practice. But a lot of times they stop practicing. They stop being a great student. They stop working on the fundamentals. And I'm throwing a challenge out there to anyone that's going to write coach on their shirt or coach on their back. That doesn't mean it's the end. That means it's the beginning. And actually, there is no end. You will continue to practice and continue to get better at your skills until the end. And then you get to say you're a coach. So what did Jerry Rice do? By him practicing and by him challenging everybody so they could see what he did. He was coaching them up. But he always did the fundamentals. So I want you to think about this. We wouldn't think twice. Don't you think Jerry Rice got bored of the same old routes? Don't you think he got bored of catching the same passes? But why do we get so bored so quick of practicing anything that we try to do as a coach? So I'm challenging you right now. Maybe you could write down some ideas. What are you bored with or what are you not practicing enough anymore? And then it gets harder to preach it. And... I will also say this, be very careful what you are practicing then, because no matter what the old adage is true, practice makes perfect. So if you are practicing the wrong things, you're going to get perfect at that too. Just like Jerry Rice was as close to perfection as a wide receiver 
and famous Super Bowl hero. So powerful, powerful story for you there. And uh, so right now we've got, and these lessons, and if you like these lessons, hey, if you like these lessons, hey, write in. I want to hear, what do you think? Is this inspiring you? Is this something that uh, is getting you excited? But we're going to go to the next word. Once you've put things in perspective, once you've really worked on practice and you've got, as a coach, you've got the people around you practicing, then I'm going to share a word actually that I'm doing a little bit right now. And I want to make sure that you take it the right way, but I got a really, really great motivational football story. And the next word is provocation, right? To provoke. It's an action or speech that prompts in particular, maybe anger or even physical retaliation. And I know what you might be saying right here now. You might say, well, Martin, easy, easy. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, hey, uh, physical retaliation. Yeah, well, hey, I've gotten to play the role of football coach and worked with a lot of football teams. And one thing that I will say in particular that I was very good at was provocation. Just at the right times. That pregame speech, provocation. That halftime speech when we needed it most, provocation. To use either actions or speech to prompt some physical retaliation out there. And now, I consider myself pretty good at it. I think every coach needs to ha be able to use their actions or their speech in certain ways to get the response you want. But there's one that's perhaps legendary beyond the rest. There's one that is perhaps legendary beyond the, beyond the rest. This is not a Super Bowl story, but it is a football story. So do you know who Newt Rockney is? Now, hopefully you know who Newt Rockney is, and he is synonymous with Notre Dame football. And uh, Newt Rockney, in many ways, we have him to thank, if you read the history books, for really putting college football on the map of the United States as the United States in the 20s and 30s was really expanding and, and, and coverage was something that was starting to happen. But there's one thing, hey, a lot of people don't know too. He's one of the winningest college football coaches ever in terms of winning percentage if he isn't still the winningest. And unfortunately, his life was cut short in an airplane crash or who knows what he would have gone on to do. But this guy was a living legend. I want, you know, this was something that really stuck out at me when I saw this. And he, he died of pneumonia and strep, unfortunately, only three weeks after their big final win in his senior season. So three weeks and his big final win in his senior season, George Gipp passes away. And I don't know if you know this, George Gipp is named all the time in the top 100 or top 50 college players of all time. He led the Irish in rushing and passing in the last three seasons. And his mark, uh, his career rushing mark lasted for over 50 years. So I want to put in perspective how great this guy was. And this guy was a legend, right? But... And you might say, oh man, he passed away. Yeah, back then they didn't have antibiotics or anything like that. So something as simple as that, it happened. But George Gipp passed away in 1920, right? So that was the 1920 season. Now, you've probably heard the story and I want to share it with you. Uh, hey, there was a big game. There was a big game and a uh, halftime speech and to rally the teams, Newt Rockney had to say something. It was against Army, and whichever team won this game, they were going to win the national championship. And Notre Dame was down 12-6. to 6. And it was time for provocation. It was time for Newt Rockney to do what he did best and fire up the boys. And here's what he did. He walked in during that halftime speech. He walked in during that halftime speech, and he told this story. And he said, guys, I'm going to say this one time, and I got to tell you, I got to tell you this. He told them that George Gipp on his deathbed, said, hey, Rock, if there's ever a time you need to use this, please do. And here's what it said. He said, I've got to go, Rock. It's all right. I'm not afraid. And sometime, Rock, when the team is up against it and when things are going wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, ask them to go in there and with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. He said, I don't know where I'll be then, Rock. But I know it, and I'll be happy. And he gave that speech, and the Notre Dame team was 
The provocation had worked and they were physically on fire and they went out there and they tore Army to pieces. And then they went on to win that game and they won the national title. In, and listen very carefully. Why am I telling this story? They won the national title in 1928. Now, you might be saying to yourself, you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, 1928? Martin, didn't you just say that George Gipp died in 1920? And yeah, so Newt Rockney, and they say, that's where the arguments happen is, did George Gipp ever really say this? Was he a master? Did this happen? Why would he have waited eight years to tell that story to the team? And you know what, unfortunately? A lot of people say what a lot of people ask me sometimes when I tell stories, which by the way, I think if you're a great coach, you got to tell stories. They say to me, they say, Martin, is that true? Is that story you told true or is that story real? And here's what I'm going to tell you. Compliments of George Gipp and the idea of provocation. It doesn't matter if the story is true. It matters if it works, right? Like, it doesn't matter if the story's true. Did it work? Did it motivate the team at the right time? Did the coach do the thing that was the right thing to make the right thing happen? Boom, yes. So does it work or is it effective? And guys, so many times as coaches, we got to look for what's effective right then, right? I'm not saying, hey, tell lies or tell things that aren't true, but it's so funny that, hey, when you hear a motivational story, don't worry if it's true or not. How did it make you feel? What did it do to you? Did it create the result? Because, and this is what I want to share with you, and this is really important. Do you know what your job is as a coach? Do you know what the sole job of a coach is? It's to get a result. You are either hired or you're put in this position to produce a result. That's the only job. That's the only thing that you need. So, like, hey, if you're in the fitness community and you're listening to me right now, your, your job is to get a result. You better be helping people lose fat, fat or build some strength or feel better about themselves. You have to do that. If you're not doing that, not doing your job stealing. If you're a sports coach right now and you're coaching a team, your job is to produce some kind of result. In particular, notice I didn't say win. Your job is to make those players better, forms of themselves all the time. And if the win happens, great. If it doesn't, but you did your job and produced the result, even better. The job is a result. Doesn't matter like, hey, this guy did this or this guy said that. Did, they, did you get the result, right? Because when the Super Bowl ends this Sunday, one of the coaches is going to get the result they want and one isn't. It's going to be hard to question who did it right and who did it wrong. But the thing is, results is the job, which takes me to the next one. And this is uh, the, the final share I have for you. And then, we're, and, uh, you know, final story. I hear this one a lot, right? I hear this story so much that, or this question, I get this question all the time. Ready? Hey, do you have to be a great coach? So I, I want to get everybody's answer right now. So I want to see everybody answer this one. Do you have to be a great player to be a great coach? I want to see what everybody thinks. Did you have to be a great player to be a great coach? I want to see right now right? As it goes to the final P's that I'm going to cover for you today. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a big story, which I think is really interesting, but I want to ask you right now. So somebody give me some answers. All right. So we got Orlando coming in. No, right. Hey, Charlene coming in from Alaska. No, wait, Hey, there's the siren. No. So Wow, we're starting to get a pretty good consensus. Right? We even got a knot there out of Sean. Hey, Cam coming in from Australia with a no. So I think, as we're seeing right here, we've got a pretty good consensus that most people would agree, or at least the coaches would agree, that you didn't have to be a great player to be a great coach. Now, here's where I'll even support that. Right now, which I think would be a harder thing, name for me somebody that was like one of the greatest players in NFL history and went on to be the greatest coach. And rarely, I, I don't even know, I, if I rack my brains on that one, it's probably not going to happen. So even as the examples for us, the greatest players don't usually go on to be the greatest coaches. And, uh, but not everybody always believes that, right? And, you know, at least, you know, if we're not talking to coaches right now. So I want to share a really cool story about the final two Ps. And I'm going to call them uh, passion and priorities, passion and priorities. And then if you stick with me, I am going to name the guaranteed winner of 
Super Bowl 54 between the San Francisco 49ers and uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. So let me tell you this little story, which is really cool. I don't know if you know my history, but uh, I, I've been a speed coach in the NFL with the, uh, the Giants and the Jets for a lot of years. And I had an NFL combine program that I helped run that uh, we sent uh, well over 100 and something guys to the NFL. And, and I had the fastest man at the NFL combine four different times, so many different draft picks every year. And every year, what that entailed was kids that were top kids coming out of college would come and they would stay with me for months and months and months, train with me two times a day, three times a day if I went to the hotel. And then the hope was that they would go on and be a player in the NFL. And uh, one player that um, I could say I'm definitely closer to in terms of a football player than almost any other, uh, one of them, his name is Chris Sims, right? So his name is Chris Sims. Chris Sims, I originally met him when he was like an eighth grader. Then he went on to his incredible high school career. He was the number one recruit coming out of college. He, he switched from Tennessee to the University of Texas last minute. And he went to Texas, and here's what's pretty cool. Whenever he would come home on break for holidays, he didn't just come by himself. He was such a great leader. He always came with a lot of members of his team. And I got to know a lot of those guys, right? Like I got to know the D-backs and the receivers and this tight end and some of the linebackers. Like, and, I, and I really felt that I was you know, involved with the University of Texas team because a lot of those kids would always be coming up and we would have great training and they would go back to school and then they would come back. And then in their senior year, all those kids that I had started seeing when they were like freshmen, they all, a bunch of them came back because they wanted to try to get ready for the, either the NFL combine or a pro day to try to go to the NFL. And when we were training them, man, we had, you know, Chris was there and Chris ended up getting drafted and, and, and had a great uh, NFL career, but cut short by an injury, but then now is doing such amazing stuff with announcing. And then we had this other kid, Rod Babers, man. He ran a 4-3 at the combine. He was a D-back. He got drafted second round. And then we had Bo Gaith, a tight end. He got drafted. And, uh, and, and there were all these other players that were with us. And uh, there was this one player. This one kid. I mean, he was always, he always showed up. He was always like trying his best, but I don't think any of us thought maybe he was going to go to the NFL. I don't think any of us thought that he was going to be a great player, but he was doing his thing. Hey, there were so many guys. They're all trying to make it. Everybody has a dream. And this is important. A coach can never take away somebody's dream. A coach has to feed into somebody's dream. You got to always feed into it and give your best. So I treated every guy like they were going to make it. But there was something unique about this guy. This guy, he always wanted to know why we were doing the drill. He always wanted to know how we could do the drill better. He was, he was spending a lot of time coaching up everybody else in the drill. There was something unique about that guy. Uh, you know, what's cool is uh, I can remember going to some of the games, right? Uh, you know, there's Chris, you know, signing it. And, you know, the guy, Rod, that I mentioned, all the guys. And I would go to them to the games. And uh, this guy, he didn't play a lot. He got in some. But, man, I was always pumped when I saw that guy get in and get a couple catches too. And uh, when they were all up there for the combine, I can remember talking to Chris. And I said, oh, man, like. I don't know, it's going to be tough for him. Do you think he's going to make it? And Chris said, ah, man, don't you worry about that. You know, he's, he's going to be more successful than all of us. He's got a huge coaching career ahead of him. Just you watch. And uh, that player was number 87 at the University of Texas. And, uh, but that player, maybe it means something different because that player's name was Kyle Shanahan the head coach now of the Super Bowl bound San Francisco 49ers. And what are the two secret P's uh, that go into that story, which I'm hoping you're saying, whoa, like you saved the best one for the last one. That's really cool. Um, guys, he always had passion. He always had passion for learning. He had, you know, he kept things in perspective, but man, he was always practicing, always practicing, and he was learning how to be a great coach. Remember, he's the son of, of a great coach, right? You know, Mike Shanahan, he's a, you know, that was his dad too. So he's got probably tremendous coaching experience. Didn't mean he was the best player, but uh, he knew how to make the best players, right? And in addition to passion, he kept priorities. 
He kept priorities. He was always learning. He was working on his craft. I've watched him work his way up from uh, assistant jobs, coordinating jobs to like now the head job. And now I think he's the second youngest guy in the NFL. And a lot of people tell me, right? So when I told somebody that they said, oh my gosh, he's the youngest guy. I said, he's not the youngest coach. He's not. The, no. Yeah. They said he's the youngest, youngest guy. One of the youngest guys. Yes. One of the youngest coaches. No. You know why? Because just like you may have heard of training age, that means how, you know, so if I'm say 40, but I've been training for 20 years. My training age is 20. Well, I'll tell you what, Kyle Shanahan's coaching age is a whole lot more than I think his 37 years or whatever it is, but pretty cool story, which don't let me fool you here. So I know what you might be saying, Martin, you know, give me the prediction, baby. Like, give me the prediction then who is going to win? So you told a Joe Montana story. Now, yeah, he did play for the Chiefs. And you told a Jerry Rice story. And now you told a Shanahan story. Are, are you rooting for the 49ers? And here, I'm not going to tell you who I'm rooting for. I'm going to tell you who's going to win. Guaranteed. And I'm going to tell you why it's important for a coach. And hey, another cool Kansas City Chiefs story. So a shout out to uh, Luther and Molly at, uh, you know, training for Warriors. Uh, they trained a number of the players this year uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs. So I want everybody to know too, like we're connected on that route too. Like this is going to be the toughest game for me because I'm invested on both sides. But that's not going to matter because I already know who's going to win. So does anybody want to know? Like, write down, if you're watching right now, does anybody want to know who's going to win? Because, hey, I have it right here. I have it right here. I've already written it down if you want to place your bets. Does anybody want to know who's going to win? I'll wait to see it. And while I'm waiting to see who you think, or you could write in again who you think, uh, I want to tell you about, hey, if you enjoyed this and how you can help me out on the mission of coaching. I don't know if you have heard. I don't know if you have heard, but I have a new book coming out. And it's called Coach to Coach. If you've enjoyed my stories, well, this thing is a giant story. It's a story with, and stories within stories. So I know not only are you going to love it, but it's going to fulfill the mission because of my mission and my organization's mission. I want to make a world of better coaches. That's what I do. I understand what I do every day. I was at uh, high school today coaching. Uh, and man, now I'm coaching here late at night. And ultimately, I need your help. In order for the book to gain traction, for the publisher to get behind it, which is one of the biggest publishers in the world, they need people to order it before it comes out. It's coming out in a few weeks, so you're going to have your copy in a few weeks, but I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you right now. If you're listening to this, if you order, if you order, I'll even change it today if you're listening to this. If you order one copy, it's supposed to be two copies, so you could order two to get one, give one to somebody else. If you order a copy or two and you send the receipt to me at martin at coachinggreatness.com, I'm going to send you some really powerful bonuses. In particular, I'll promise you this. You think my, the stuff I'm sharing here is good? I got something so great for you. You will print them out. You will put them on your wall and you're gonna need to know them every time before you go out and coach. So guys, the book is called Coach to Coach. It's available on Amazon. It's all over the place. You gotta have it. If you know somebody that needs it, tell them about it. You'll be helping me. And then, hey, and then I'm gonna be fired up to keep bringing you more information too. So are we ready? What do we got? Hey, so Sean is saying lay it on us. Pookie wants to hear what, who won this thing. You want to know who's going to win? You ready for this? It's not going to be the best team. The best team is not going to win on Sunday. It's the team on Sunday that plays the best on Sunday that's going to win. I've made this prediction every year if you haven't seen it. So, so watch this. I just predicted. So will I be wrong? No, it's going to be the team that plays the best on Sunday will win. And here's the thing. So, and that might not be the best team. How do I know that? As a coach for many years, we played teams that I know the kids were better than us, but we were the best team that day and we won. So here's why that's important. Number one, that's why it's crazy to bet on a game because you can't, you can't know who's going to be the best on that day right? And I know my guy, Phil is listening to this. He might be arguing with that, but that's my philosophy on gambling on games or betting on games. But uh, here's the thing. Underdogs win all the time. We love that story more than anything. Why? Because the person performed the best on that day. And this leads me to the big finale. You know who has a big role and who plays the best 
on the day that it counts the most? The coach. It's the coach's job. Remember I said to get results. Well, one of the ultimate results is to have his or her players play their best when it counts the most. You want to talk about the art of coaching. Holy cow. That's where I've deep dove into figuring out how do I pull out the best in someone else when it counts the most. Especially when someone they're competing against is already better. And I've watched it happen time and time again. Not just in the NFL, not just at the NFL Combine, not just in the UFC. So did you hear that? The person that will perform the best on the day it counts the most, in particular this weekend, is Super Bowl Sunday. That will be the person that wins. And that doesn't have anything to do sometimes with who's better. If you disagree with me, I'd love to uh, hear about that on that choice because it's kind of pretty foolproof. But uh, here's the piece that I want to make sure is uh, that you get across. One little piece of advice that I always found is, going back to Joe Montana's thing, keep it in perspective. A lot of times when we watch the Super Bowl at the start or games at the start, People, it's never going good and they're tightened up and they're not playing well. It just happened in the collegiate national championship, I think, where, holy cow, as I watched the beginning of that game, that is not what I would have thought it would have happened at the end of that game. But sometimes what happens is everybody gets too tight. They say, this is it. This is too important. Do or die. This is it. Hey, a coach's job is to remind everybody, hey, it's okay that something's important, but you got to keep it in perspective. So I don't want anybody to forget, hey, it's a Super Bowl, but we all have little Super Bowls in our life. And for it, you got to be able to perform your best when it counts the most. And that is what a coach can help someone do. That is what the job is of those two coaches that are going into this game this weekend. And that's your job as a coach because I'll make you this promise because it's happened to me a lot. There's no greater gift that you can give somebody you coach that they do their best on the day that it counts the most. And on those magic days when they happen, and whoever it's going to happen for in the Super Bowl this weekend, they're going to never forget it. And don't you forget that a coach has a strong play in that. So that was my Super Bowl edition of Coach to Coach. I hope you enjoyed it. As you always see, guys, I put together a lot of great stuff for you. Go back and listen to uh, some of the old shows if you see them either on my Facebook or we'll put them up in here. Uh, Hey, Listen, if you like this stuff, you got to check out the Into the Roar podcast. I don't know if you've listened to that yet. I've got over 130 episodes. So if you like this, wait till you see the stuff that I have for you there. And then finally, before I let you go, hey, have a great Super Bowl weekend and uh, Super Bowl week too. And ultimately, I'm hoping something there inspired you to be a little bit of a better coach. It inspired you a little bit to understand your role and your importance as a coach And uh, hey, ultimately, again, if you want to thank me, one great way to do it is, hey, check out my new book, Coach to Coach, because we are on a mission. And I hope you're joining me on it. It's a mission to make a world of better coaches, because if everybody was a better coach, the world would be a better place. So, hey, this is your coach for today, Martin Rooney. Enjoy the Super Bowl. May the best team win. No, not may the best team win. The, the team that plays the best when it counts the most will win. But uh, hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Thanks for sticking with me the whole time. And I'm going to keep bringing you more here at Coach to Coach.